Grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace be unto you from our Lord, our risen Redeemer, Jesus, the living Christ. You have tuned into Conversations with the Pastor, and I am the Reverend Dr. Kevin D. Miller, who has, and I have the wonderful blessing of serving as the pastor of the Carter Community AME Church located in Jamaica, New York. Conversations with a Pastor is an opportunity for us to engage in enriching dialogue with persons from all walks of life to be able to get some interesting and compelling insight that we can use to help us shape our communities and be an advocate for justice and do great things for the glory of God. So I thank God that you thought enough of God and of us to be here with us today. Today we have as our guest, the Reverend Dr. Mark Kelly Tyler. He is the pastor of historic Mother Bethel AME Church located in the city of brotherly love that is philadelphia pennsylvania we thank god for him he is a native of oakland california he is someone who is a historian he is a documentary producer he is a radio host a social justice advocate and he is someone that has been on the front line for so many social justice issues he is a graduate of clark atlanta university he is a graduate of Payne Theological Seminary. He is a graduate where he earned his doctoral degree from the University of Dayton. And we praise God for his commitment. He currently is the 52nd pastor of Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia. And he has the wonderful distinction of being the pastor of that great congregation during the bicentennial anniversary of the AME Church, which was held in Philadelphia back in 2016. I have known him now for some 15 years. He is a friend, he is a brother, he is a colleague. And I thank God that God thought enough of us that made his schedule available for him to join us on this day. So today I say good day to you, my brother. How are you today? Doing great, thank you for having me on again. Oh, it is a wonderful gift. You was on with us a couple of weeks ago as we were in conversation about the transition that has taken place in this country. Uh, but I wanted to bring you back to have a good and enriching conversation, particularly through the lens of the AME Church. Uh, this week, we will be celebrating our Founders Day, our Founders Day celebration in Philadelphia. Well, it won't be in Philadelphia. Generally, we would be in Philadelphia, uh, gathering together all through the First Episcopal District, uh, celebrating the founding of this great denomination. Uh, so I want to thank you because through your lens of historian, I know that you can give us a wealth of information as it relates to our church, as it relates to where we, uh, how we were formed, where we have come from, and also offer your insights in terms of where we are going. Mark, I, it occurred to me, even as I was thinking about this conversation, for as long as I've known you, uh, there's still some, there's still a great deal of things I don't know about you. One of the things I don't know about you is what brought you to the AME Church. I don't know if you were always AME, uh, if you uh, if you became AME along the way, uh, but I know you have a passion for the AME Church today. So say, say a little bit about what brought you to this great denomination. Yeah, well, so let me just say it is interesting. So I grew up in Oakland, California, and um, didn't know much about the denomination growing up. I, my mother didn't make us go to church. She was, she was kind of that first generation to try that experiment. Don't try that, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> it didn't turn out well. And uh, my brother and I we got into just a ton of trouble in the mid 80s. And uh, I mean, literally, it, th this story could have gone so totally different. I could have been like friends of mine who are still incarcerated to this day. Um, Many of my friends did not live to see 21, and so we were living that kind of life. Uh, when I was saved at uh, the age of 19, I guess, um, in Oakland, middle of the crack wars, the beginning of the crack wars there, um, I started going to church. And, you know, long story short is the only person that I knew, the two only two people that I knew who went to church all the time, it was my grandmother and my aunt, my mother's sister, so my maternal grandmother. And so I went to church with her. It just happened to be an AME church, Brookings AME in Oakland. I had no idea, honestly, what I was stepping into. Uh, as a young person, of course, I started experimenting with other churches. I tried, you know, um, apostolic churches and Pentecostal churches and Baptist churches in worship and other things. But I felt really at home in the AME church and uh, settled into it accepted a call to preach about a year or so later, went on to Clark Atlanta University and then to Payne Seminary. And, um, but, you know, initially I kind of thought this was just my grandmother's church and that was it. I did not understand 
the extent of, you know, the history that my family has in the a church. Now, you're not going to believe, well, maybe you will, but um, so my grandmother was one of the Black Rosie the Riveters. She ended up in California because in Arkansas, you know, she couldn't find gainful employment for her children in the 1940s. They were hiring Black women at plants, and the Great Migration was moving Arkansas folk toward California, uh, much in the same way South Carolinians came up to Philadelphia and New York. And so she jumped on the train, uh, no money, somebody bought her ticket, and she moved to California. She immediately joined Parks Chapel AME because in Arkansas, she'd been AME all of her life. She grew up in Gethsemane AME Church in Comento, Arkansas, our family church, going back to the 1860s and 1870s. Now, her, so my great, 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 great grandfather was the, the member who moved them from Pittsburgh to Little Rock after the Civil War, because that was the big, that was the Western move then, you know. He was an AME preacher, the Reverend Jesse W. Devine. I have learned more about my family's history through AME material than I have anywhere else, because he's all through publications. He was born in 1818. In Pennsylvania, of all places, um, became an A&E preacher in Ohio, served in some of the places where I have served. <laughs> so I was in Oxford, Ohio. He had the Hamilton Circuit at that time, which included Oxford. Um, so it's just this this crazy mix, right? So as an A&E, his children were A&E, their children. So on my mother's side. Our family has been uninterrupted AME all the way back to that oldest ancestor that I can confirm with certainty, Jesse W. Devine. And my children are now have embraced it. I've got, you know, nieces and great nieces and great nephews. So our family has been AME, what, 10 or more generations, um, is, which is something, again, that I've really fully only understood within the last 10 or 12 years. And so it's an amazing journey. Wow, that is a rich, rich history. Uh, and, and it really is in your wheelhouse when you talk about history to be able to track that with your family, uh, to be able to look and see the hand of God and how God has kind of kind of knitted you so closely together with the AME Church. Uh, I see over to your right shoulder there, you have a picture of our founder, uh, Bishop Richard Allen. Uh, and you now have the, uh, the unique distinction of serving as the pastor of the Mother Church of the AME Church, Mother Bethel in Philadelphia. Say a little bit about that rich history of Mother Bethel. Uh, say a little bit also about the museum that's there and what people see when they come into Mother Bethel. Yeah, so Mother Bethel is, um, a, a lot of times people confuse it. They say it's the oldest black church in America and that's not right. I think the best way to characterize it is the oldest and the first independently, you know, independent black worship experience. So there are churches that predate us in uh, Savannah and in uh, so Savannah, Georgia, and also I think in South Carolina, but these were Baptist churches that were started by whites for blacks. Um, but we think about like an independent, like, no, we're starting it our own, we're building it, you know, we're buying the land. The AME church is it. And Mother Bethel is ground zero for that experience. 1787, members of um, St. George's Methodist Church, the Black membership by and large walked out because they entered in as brothers and sisters. Now, what, one thing that's really interesting about the timing, and I've gotten a greater appreciation since I've been in Philadelphia. If you remember in 1787, that's really when the country officially started, as we know now, electing presidents and, you know, the, the official Congress coming in. They were moving from the interim version after the years between the winning of the Revolutionary War and this interim government into what is now the permanent government. George Washington was soon to be elected president and all of that. What was the big issue that was being argued and debated during that time? It was what do we do about black people? You know, do we end slavery once and for all? You know, many of the Northern founders said we look like hypocrites fighting for independence only to now keep people enslaved. That's not a good look, not good optics. But the Southerners were wed to the system and said, just give us a few more years of this free labor. And once we, you know, cultivate the land and get the economy going, 
Y'all can have them back. We don't really care. We just need to use them. And as a compromise, the country said every state can do what they want. Now, this was hammered out six blocks from where Mother Bethel sits today. And all of those founding congregations, Christ Church Episcopal Church, St. Peter's Episcopal Church, St. George's Methodist Church, the Art Street Meeting House, all of these worship places that are still there today, where these founding fathers, air quotes, would go to church on Sundays and sit and listen to preachers. I often wonder what would have happened if those clergy people would have pushed back and said, you're not welcome in these churches if you endorse something like that. You know, you cannot, we cannot have a country that starts off with this stain on us. But instead, they were silent. And churches, by and large, were silent because they, too, didn't want to offend people and lose the money that they were receiving to build their own institutions. And as a result, when the country made a deal and cut Black people out, churches conformed and followed suit. You know, puts a spin on that text. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Well, the churches became conformed. And so the segregated pews followed that decision, at least in the Methodist church. So as the country embraced segregation and racism and, and you know, plantation life, so did the churches. And so the Methodist church, which had at that time in its book of discipline, its first book of discipline from 1784, said that no good Methodist, uh, you cannot be a Methodist in good standing if you own slaves. Mm -hmm. Within a generation, that language was gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, so Richard Arnold, what drove him was, sure, I want to be a church like, with, you know, go to a church like this, where slavery is outlawed for, as members and you can't be a part of the clergy, but the denomination turned its back on it. And sadly, it forced in droves Black members out, out of Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, Charleston, all around the country, these spontaneous movements that we today would call Black Lives Matter, not even connected to each other, didn't know each other, had no way of communicating, but they all felt the same thing, that we would rather worship uh, under our own vine and fig tree than to worship in this way. And so in a nutshell, that was kind of the seed that was planted that ultimately gave birth and rise to these independent church movements that 30 years later would become knitted together in a new denomination, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Dr. Tyler, I've heard you say or reference in a different kind of way uh, in different settings uh, about, about what I recall you saying was the first social justice movement, right? The first walkout. Uh, say a little bit more about that, uh, because I know p you, you've often framed it to say that that the first uh, social justice movement wasn't a sit-in at a lunch counter, but it was when uh, we we got up and walked out of St. George's Church. Uh, so so give give a little give a little bit more context about that and that movement when they actually walked out of the church to start Mother Bethel. Sure. So you know, A and will appreciate this. You know, we also talk about these moments and we collapse history into one moment. We do. We kind of talk about history. We give it the Hollywood treatment. You know, if you go see a movie in Hollywood, it's, you know, they walked out and they left St. George's, went down the street. And, you know, there was a prefabricated modular church that was waiting on the parking lot for them. That's, that's nothing <laughs> could be further from the truth. Uh, I mean, think about the timing. 1787, the walkout. And it's not until 1816 that, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court weighs in on whether or not Richard Island and others have the right to even organize their own denomination and that they are free from Methodist control. That is 29 years, if my math is right. So you're talking about, you know, three decades have gone by where it is a serious back and forth, a, a, tuck, a, a push and a pull. There are moments where the white Methodist elder in St. George's believes that he is in control of this little Bethel church. Richard Allen and others disagree. They say, no, this is our church. We, and we have a contract with you all to, be, to come in and basically provide religious services to preach, to marry us, to bury us, to do baptisms and Holy Communion. And, but for 30 years, um, as Methodist pastors change, and they're changing at that time annually. So each year there's a different pastor at St. George's. You get one who is more uh, in body and, in, in, you know, uh, in bed with slaveholders who comes in. We're going to rein these Negroes in. 
and then others who are more liberal who are like, no, no, no. And so each year it is, you don't know what you're going to get if you're a member of Bethel Church and if you're Richard Allen. So they built their first building in 1794. It was dedicated by, uh, by Methodist Bishop Francis Asbury. Um, they bought the land previously in 1791. So 87, they walk out. 91, they buy land. They don't get a building until 94. So that in and of itself is multiple years before they even have an official building to worship in. Uh, until that time, I imagine they're just meeting kind of as classes, like class leaders are checking in on folk, having services where they can. And um, they discover that there are other movements like this. They find out about the Black Methodists who've done the same thing in Baltimore and who've been worshiping on their own. They find out about the Black Methodists who've done this in Salem, New Jersey. They find out about, you know, folk up in Attleboro, which is down Langhorne, Pennsylvania, Bucks County. And even in Wilmington, Delaware, that group decided ultimately not to join. But by 1816, Richard Allen has had enough. He goes to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, petitions to be free from Methodist control. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court remarkably agrees with him. And the moment he gets that agreement, he writes to all of them and says, let's get together and let's talk about forming a new church. In April of 1816, they gather in Philadelphia. We consider it now the first general conference. They agree to create a pact. And Richard Allen um, is ultimately successful in becoming elected and consecrated the bishop of this new AME church movement. There's a little controversy with that. Daniel Coker was elected first, but never consecrated. Um, Richard Allen persuaded them to have the election again uh, because he was not there when they did the election. And they elect him and they consecrate him as the first bishop. And the denomination instantly begins to grow. Dr. Tyler, uh, I said at the top of the show that you, uh, all these different things you've done, you are a seminary professor, you are uh, the pastor of Mother Bethel, uh, a radio host, but you are also a documentary producer. Uh, you put together uh, Richard Allen, the Apostle of Freedom, and we'll share that link with those who are watching. I want to, I want to invite them and encourage them uh, uh, to watch it because some of what you talk about, you capture uh, in this documentary. One of the things you named just now is you talked a little bit about the tension, uh, the tension uh, certainly between uh, those who walked out of St. George's Church. Uh, so the AME Church and the United Methodist Church is this almost 30 year period. You talked a little bit about the tension uh, between uh, in the first election of who was gonna be the first elected and consecrated uh, Bishop of the church. One of the things I remember from your documentary that you pointed out uh, and I think it, I would love to hear you say a little bit about this, because uh, sometimes we look through history with uh, with these uh, with, through through this rosy lens that everything just worked out perfectly, right? Uh, but one of the things you pointed out in your documentary is that all of the black people didn't leave St. George's, right? We we want we want to think that hey everybody was all one, one accord, everybody got up, thought this was wrong, and every all the black people walked out. Uh, but one of the things you, you, you were intentional about was that everybody didn't leave. Uh, so say a little bit about that moment, because uh, sometimes you want to think that we all thought this was a great thing. We all thought this was the right thing to do. Uh, but there was clearly, clearly a, a bit of a separation there because everybody didn't get up and walk out. Yeah, so we did the documentary for those. About, so let me just say this. Shout out to the Reverend Fred Day, my friend who at that time of filming the documentary was the pastor of St. George's. Uh, Fred is now the um, general secretary of the United Methodist Church for their history and archives. But he gave us, you know, freedom to do all of those uh, B-roll shots in St. George's. So when you see that balcony scene, that is in the balcony of St. George's. And it gives me chills now even talking about it. Um, the scenes with Drina Lee and where the elder tries to take over the church, those are in their museum. Um, and so, um, so I remember that day specifically as, uh, now mind you, we, I found the money for the documentary. I kind of got into documentary filmmaking because we paid some people to do it. And I felt like, you know, they weren't fully understanding our experience. And I started to, I was drawn into it more and more, just trying to correct the story. And so as everybody got up and walked out, I said, wait a minute, something doesn't feel right. You know, I said, cause everybody didn't leave. You know, they actually went and got 
a guy that they call Black Harry Hoosier as a preacher uh, who ended up in Indiana. So, hey, go Hoosiers. I don't know if you all know <laughs> that you got your name from Black Harry. But um, <laughs> there was, uh, yeah, I'll probably make a lot of Indiana fans particularly upset given how strong the KKK is in Indiana these days. But yeah, but 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 they but they the Methodist Church propped up Harry Hoosier as a counter to Richard Allen, and at one point even opened a church across the street from Mother Bethel. So there was always an attempt not only to seize control of Mother Bethel the building, but also to um, create an incentive for people to leave for something they deemed to be better than you know Richard Allen. And by all accounts, I'm sure Harry Hoosier was a much better preacher than Richard Allen or Absalom Jones, but people by and large stuck with Richard Allen because the, because of what it represented, you know, freedom, much more, much more than a worship, good worship service. It was what the future held out. And so, you know, black worshipers have always been a part of the Methodist church, um, even after the Civil War, when the Methodists said, okay, fine, we're going to create the CME Church. At that time, the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, now a Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, they said, now you Black Methodists can have that. But even when that was set up, people said, no, 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 we still want to stay here with you. I mean, I don't, you know, look, personally, I, I guess I understand it. And everybody has to go and worship where they choose. So I don't knock it. But for me, um, I think that there is something powerful about having, you know, the ability to control one's own destiny. I mean, given the fact that it's still God who is directing it, but to be able to look up at bishops and, you know, presiding elders and pastors and presidents of the lay and missionaries and the YPD, um, as they say, and we got 99 problems, but racism ain't one. I mean, so whatever our issues may be, the one thing I don't have to worry about is, did I not get the appointment because I'm Black? And um, and it's clear that because of the conversations that are continually going on in the United Methodist Church, that many of the problems that were there in 1787 are still there. And, um, you know, the folk have to kind of work this stuff out wherever they are. I want to invite you to say, uh, uh, speak about, th this is so rich, Dr. Tyler, I, and I appreciate the, the history lesson. I appreciate what you're sharing with me because I'm learning some things. I'm sure our viewers are learning some things. Uh, and my mind is racing, uh, trying to get in all of this stuff while I got you. There, there, there are probably three areas I, I want to ask you to speak to. The first has to do uh, with uh, the bicentennial celebration. Uh, and please correct, correct my, my, uh, my memory here. Uh, but if I remember correctly, leading into that, uh, there was a bust uh, that had been lost uh, and then had been rediscovered and brought back uh, to Philadelphia. Uh, so I want to ask if you would speak to that. And I also want to ask uh, if you would speak to uh, the statue of Richard Allen uh, that is outside of Mother Bethel. Because if I recall correctly, uh, if I recall what you had said as you were teaching us back then, uh, that in the city of Philadelphia, there was not a statue of any black person. Uh, con and, and considering the history that you're describing, uh, it is surprising uh, to hear that that is the case. So if you could talk first about uh, the history of this bust uh, that was lost and then rediscovered, and then talk a little bit about the statue of Richard Allen that is at Mother Bethel today. Sure, so the bust of Richard Allen um, was, it was actually made in 1876 as a part of the of America's uh, centennial celebration. There was a World's Fair uh, type event. It was held for six months in Philadelphia at Fairmont Park. And uh, it was an incredible, incredible exposition. In fact, many of the buildings that were built then are still in existence. And when you drive through Philly, you see these old buildings. That's what they were. It was actually created. It's this huge World's Fair. And so there were exhibits from everywhere. There were a few entries that were done by black artists, but they were primarily paid for uh, or commissioned by whites. And then there were some whites who did, you know, um, contributions of black people. But what stood out about the Richard Allen bust, uh, this, this, this beautiful bust of Richard Allen, our founder, that was in this big uh, marble gazebo, was that it was the only 
piece of uh, art or entry that was done by Black people for Black people and about Black people. So the Arkansas Annual Conference, again, of all places, determined that they were going to, you know, begin this drive to have a bust that would be on display at, you know, at, um, in Philadelphia. And so the ancestor I talked about, Jesse W. Devine, he was a part, obviously, of that annual conference. It was a part of that fundraising and a part of raising this up. Now, many Northerners were leading the AME church in these Southern states at that time. And so they already had connections with AMEs all around. So Reverend J.T. Jennifer was one of the one of the leading uh, lights on this, and he took the took the reins, and they made this thing a reality. Now, the only thing they did not do there was not a black uh, uh, sculptor who did it. There was a, a white guy by the last name of White in Cincinnati who built the sculpture, who built this again this gazebo that you could sit in, and they put it on a train bound for Philadelphia from Cincinnati. The train had a terrible accident and the gazebo portion was totally destroyed. The only thing that survived the wreck was the bust. You know, this bust is not very big. And for an eight-month, I'm sorry, for a six-month celebration at Fairmont Park, the bust was only on display for the last eight days. By the time they got it, they just put it up on a little stand, a little obelisk, and they put it there and they dedicated it and called it a day. But it was still a triumph for them, right? It wasn't what they wanted, but isn't that the black experience? But somehow they still made it across the finish line before it was too late. Now, when it was over, to kind of tell you some of the the politics, the, the politics of what happens in local churches as well. Uh, back then, Mother Bethel was uh, was continually torn between being led by the pastor or by a group of the trustees. Um, that I mean, at one point, twenty years before this they had actually put the pastor out of the building. The pastor had to break in and, you know, with armed people and go to court to, to regain control. And so again, so in the 1870s, when the, when the denomination said to Mother Bethel, it makes sense for this thing to stay here, the church said, no, we don't want it. <laughs> so, <laughs> do not ask me why they didn't want it. And so it didn't stay at Mother Bethel. It ended up at Wilberforce University, where Bishop Payne still had a lot of influence, and it was a brand new university and kind of our flagship. And it, so it went there. And over the years, like things happened, it disappeared. It would reappear over time and then disappear until the story of where the bus came from got disconnected. Now, fast forward. I'm a graduate of Payne Seminary across the street from Wilberforce. For years, it was in their library on the reference desk, along with a bunch of other little busts, and not, and not in a prominent way, but more like a big paperweight. I'm not kidding. And so people, you'd walk in, and it was like, uh, uh, you know, in uh, those movies about Newt Rotney and Notre Dame, where they hit yeah. the stump on their way yeah. out to a game. If people would walk in the library, you'd like tap it on the head for good luck. You knew it was Richard Allen, but nobody, I mean, they penciled his eyes in. <laughs> so, I mean, literally... For years, I've seen this thing and didn't know that it had the significance. Uh, right before I was assigned to, to Mother Bethel, I like to think Bishop Norris gave me this assignment to test me. You know, he appointed me there for the first time. And this is after Bishop Leith was elected, before I was appointed. So it was about a four-month period of time in 2008. So Bishop Norris says, uh, yeah, I'm trying to find out something about this bust of Richard Allen. You know anything about it? It was on display. And I'm like, I don't know the story. So oh, yeah, go talk to Ruby Boyd. She's one of the members of Mother Bethel. She was almost 100 at this time, and one of the uh, archivists. And so I meet her, get the information, and I go on this search. And when I tell you, when I discovered that the bust was that bust, and I called Wilberforce and talked to the archivist, and she says, oh, Reverend Tyler, some white lady from Philadelphia, from Temple, came here last year and said the same thing, but we didn't believe her. <laughs> so she connected me and me and Dr. Susanna Gold connected. Now, if you really want to know more about it, Dr. Susanna Gold is a is an excellent researcher and has done much more study on it and others. So she technically found it first, uh, but I was able to convince the president, Dr. Hardaway, to let us have it on loan, uh, where it's still, it's still on permanent loan at Mother Bethel. We cleaned it up and um, got some funding for it. Uh, it's just a beautiful story. 
And uh, I'll, I'll have to give you the link so you can share it with folks. There was, there was written up a lot in the newspaper back then in 2010 as we celebrated Bishop Allen's, what would have been his 250th birthday. But it's a, it's a great story. Wow. Now say a little bit about the statue of Richard Allen that's at Mother Bethel. Sure. So the statue is a, a tremendous um, tribute to uh, Bishop Allen. Uh, it was created and funded by our current bishop, Bishop Gregory Ingram. And, um, you know, it's funny. So the vision for a Richard Allen statue had come and gone a few times before Bishop uh, Ingram arrived in the first district. Uh, going, I think, all the way back to the 1800s, I believe it was Bishop J. Baz uh, Pitts Campbell who wanted to put up a statue of Bishop Allen and was trying to get a drive going, but it just didn't go anywhere. In the 1940s, there was a real commission, a committee that had been put in place uh, that was, I mean, it was, they met all the time. They had actually gotten to the point where they had a, a sculpture picked out and a drawing. They became, they started to debate about the, about the way it looked. And um, before you know it, it just kind of, the whole thing just fell apart and it just, it didn't happen. So when Bishop Ingram came, um, Bishop Ingram came to the district, uh, he initially wanted to put it at 3801, uh, our headquarters, and then asked, you know, did I think the trustees of Mother Bethel would support it being there? And I was like, Bishop, do I think? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, I didn't want to say anything, Bishop, but they were a little bit put off by the fact that it wasn't going to be at Mother Bethel. So it, it was a great win-win. And so we gave up a portion of the parking lot. And uh, Bishop Ingram was, is responsible for, you know, the fundraising side of it um, and really selling it and making it a denominational effort. It turned out to be a beautiful courtyard. And the sculptor of it, uh, who passed away not too long ago, Fern Cunningham, who did a great tribute of Harriet Tubman in Boston. She was a Boston sculptor. She is the sculptor of the Richard Allen statue, and she was a member of the AME Church. So it was just, uh, you know, it was just something that was the right timing. That it would have been, um, I'm trying to think, did it go up before the Caddo statue or not? The Octavius Caddo statue in Philadelphia was also being worked on about the same time. And uh, Octavius Caddo was a martyr during the election of uh, 1871, I believe, in Philadelphia, shot and killed on election day. Uh, his father had come from Charleston and had been one of the migrants to the North, like Daniel Payne and others. And I think at one point his dad even was affiliated with the AME. But Octavius Caddo is a, a huge figure in Philadelphia, kind of like the Martin Luther King of Philadelphia in the 1860s and 1870s. And um, the city put a statue up of him on the apron of City Hall. But But these are the only two you know, public statues of uh, black individuals in Philadelphia. There is a, a, a black soldiers war memorial that is a statue of a bunch of anonym, anonymous men. But when you think about the, the incredible history of black people in a city like Philadelphia, black women who have no statues uh, in their honor, uh, just, you know, and the city is replete with incredible stories it speaks to one of the one of the real problems in this country, right? So in Philly, you look at the bridges, it's the Ben Franklin, it's the Commodore Barry, it's the Betsy Ross, it's the Walt Whitman. There's no Richard Allen, no Sarah Allen, you know, no Morris Brown, as though we had not made significant contributions. And so um, if they don't do it for you, you got to do it for yourself. So I think that it's really important for us to to start marking these moments. So black sororities ought to start creating statues of, you know, black women trailblazers. I mean, Kamala Harris, who's an AKA, is not the first, you know, AKA to go off and be the first at something. You think of Mae Jameson and others, and, um, and every sorority has these same stories. And so I think that to me is what the statue suggests, is that you have to do for self. Dr. Tyler, over your shoulder again is that picture of Richard Allen, which uh, is the postal stamp that was commissioned uh, for the bicentennial celebration. Uh, and, and that is, is now part of our history. You being at Mother Bethel is a part of history. Uh, just maybe one or two more questions. Could you say something about the history of the museum at Mother Bethel? 
Uh, I've had the blessing and the privilege of being able to be there and to, and to walk into Mother Bethel and see the museum. Uh, but I realize even in our conversation that I don't recall uh, the history of how that got formed. Uh, and I know that, that our Bishop, uh, Bishop Richard Allen is there, uh, certainly Sarah Allen is there, but say a little bit about, about the history of the museum that is there at Mother Bethel. Sure, so the Richard Allen Museum at Mother Bethel, we, are, we, we just started doing uh, virtual tours as well. So our uh, Mother Bethel Historical Society, uh, which was started in the early 1900s, uh, by the historical, by the Mother Bethel Historical Commission, which was also started about that time. Both of those, think about that, the early 1900s, right? They, they dedicated a group that would be responsible for keeping the artifacts of Mother Bethel. So from a very early time, there was a, a, a sense that there's something special about this place. And so what we have today, we have been able to build upon the fact that there were people who said, you know what? I know that these pews are raggedy and that they're from the first church and we are much more sophisticated than that now. And it's 1841. We've got this beautiful modern building. That's the building before the current one we're in now, which was a beautiful, magnificent building with uniform pews and everything else. And, it, and you know, we don't want to be reminded of the past, but somebody had the foresight to say, no, 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 don't throw it all out. And so when you walk in, you see the pews that founders sat on, perhaps Richard Allen himself. When you see the pulpit that, that we're told Richard Allen built with his own hands and preached from, when you see the candle stands, you know, from the, from the earlier buildings and all these little bits and pieces of our history, it is just, it, it leaves you in awe because there's a direct line all the way back to those founding members. And so you'll experience that in the museum, as well as other things that have come along the way. Uh, but prior to the pandemic, we were in conversations about a capital campaign that would actually make the museum five to six times bigger than what it is and a much different experience. My hope is that the new museum will be one that is not just artifacts. Uh, right now, that's kind of what it is, but one that is much more tied around themes. Um, I have this notion that, that what you see in the history of the AME Church is that people have come along and, as I say, appropriated the story of the walkout of St. George's, a walkout of self-determination, and taken it and owned it for themselves. Think about Rosa Parks for a moment, an AME member, the, a stewardess in her church in Montgomery, Alabama. And she, she's a part of the NAACP. She's been an organizer when King was in you know, in elementary school, she was doing organizing, helping rape victims in Alabama. But as she's thinking about her contribution, they need a sacrificial lamb. She sits down on a bus and defies them and will not move. And I have to think that at some point in that experience, she was drawing as strength what Richard Allen and Sarah and others had done when they walked out of St. George's, their walking out was her sitting down. A. Philip Randolph, union organizer, one of the architects of the March on Washington in 1963, was a member of the Amy Church in New York City. You know, first in the Deep South, but an active member. And you have to think that he, too, is living out the legacy of Richard Allen. And, you know, Brown Chapel, Amy Church in Selma was the gathering place for John Lewis and Amelia Boynton Robinson and all of the others because it sits next to physically the Edmund Pettus Bridge. It's where they gathered before Bloody Sunday. After Bloody Sunday, it's where they brought the wounded back. It's where they gathered when King came to march again. And that place holds a special place for us. But again, I think all of these persons have been able to do it because we have a model. I mean, an exemplar in Richard Allen that gives us permission. You know, some people ask me, like I'm sure they ask you, well, don't you ever get concerned about being so political? You know, like you can't, the church shouldn't be in all that stuff. It should just preach Jesus. And I'm like, are you crazy? I mean, <laughs> that's the most un thing I've ever heard. You know, Richard Allen was out boycotting goods that were made by enslaved labor. They wouldn't buy produce if it came from, you know, uh, plantations. You know, they, they were writing pamphlets denouncing slavery. 
He was preaching sermons in the same pulpit I preach from now, you know, denouncing the evil of slavery and admonishing those who held them to release them. And so we are living out the legacy. Some denominations can spend all their time trying to tell you how to get rich by making their pastor richer. That's your prerogative. But that is not what we've been called to. We have a very special calling upon us, and it is to speak truth to power. Whether that power is a Republican, whether that power is a Democrat, whether it's an independent or the Green Party, it does not matter. We are about the liberation and reconciliation of God's people on this earth. And we have lived that out now, not just in America, but on five continents and in 40 nations. And all around the world, people have taken that same spirit, including South Africa, Namibia, and all these other places that have also lived into that same liberation um, spirit. Dr. Tyler, I, I've got a hundred more questions. I know I cannot keep you any longer. You have, you have given us so much knowledge. Even when you mentioned the pandemic, it reminded me of uh, this is not the first time the AME Church has been in the midst of a pandemic when you think about uh, the, the yellow fever that plagued uh, Philadelphia and how Richard Allen and so many people uh, were a part of that. We, we, we'll share that history with people. Uh, but I want to thank you for your time today uh, for, for uh, this very rich and deep and motivating conversation. Uh, do you have any last words that you want to share with folks? You, you took us to Selma. You took us to South Africa. You took us all around the globe in terms of all the continents. Is there anything else that, that you want to share with us today, uh, perhaps about where you might see uh, the AME Church going from here uh, in this new uh, political climate? Yeah, well, first of all, let me just thank you for the opportunity to do this. And I think, um, you know, even with what you're doing, the, this creative uh, way of using technology and even the pandemic where people are just everybody, everybody's doing Zoom now to use it for something like this. Uh, you never know where this is going to land and, and what it will do. So you're really to be, you know, recognized and celebrated for this. And I appreciate it. Um, going forward, I just say, listen, again, again, we have to tap into our ancestors. Um, and they had an abiding faith that things are always moving towards something better. Um, and, and I know it's it's difficult because, and I try to say this to to fellow activists and organizers today, that we have to remember the past because the past will help us keep the present in context, right? That, and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to compare or diminish or lift up another, but we have been in times that in addition to what we are facing today, there was also enforced slavery for 90% of black people. Um, and there was a time when 80 to 90% of black people, though they were technically free, did not have the right to even cast a ballot vote, though they were paying taxes and everything else. And that, you know, so that we are in a different place right now. We still wrestle with the same issues, but if the generations before us could make it, given the additional things that they had to battle, then certainly those of us, many, you know, of our young people now didn't even know the president wasn't black until a certain point, because all they knew was a black president and now a black vice president. You, you understand? I mean, it's like you, you're talking about there were generations that didn't even know a black city council member where that would get your house blown up. They even try to run for city council. And so I think that we have to hold on to that abiding hope and that abiding faith that says that, you know, that the universe does bend toward justice that there are people who want to try to bend it the other direction, but it is bit that we are on the right track, that we cannot give up. And I love that, that great Methodist hymn that we sing, all for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed on every side or pressed by every fall. I can't remember the way that that line goes, but, but I wanted to say that we cannot have a faith that shrinks. We need a faith that expands, and it expands because our faith is not in ourselves or our stuff or what we can do, but our faith is in the unseen hand and power of God who fights our battles. If God be for us, nobody can be against us. That served us well in 1787, in 1907, and it'll serve us as well in the 2020s. And so I say, let's go in faith. 
Amen. Well, God bless you, my brother. Let me offer a word of prayer. Gracious, loving, and wonderful God, thank you again for the unique spiritual insight uh, that was provided to us today through the Reverend Dr. Mark Kelly Tyler. God, we pray again for him, for his witness, for his family, for his journey. God, we thank you that he is this advocate for justice. We thank you, God, because he is this contemporary apostle for freedom. So God, we just pray that you would continue to protect him, anoint him, and direct him, God, in all that he does, that you, God, alone will be glorified. So we thank you, God. We thank you, Jesus. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. It is in the name of Jesus that we do offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my brother. Hold on for one second. Amen. Just share your information again so that people can get in touch with you. And we're going to put all of these links into our chat so people can learn uh, more about Mother Bethel. We again want to thank our guest today, the Reverend Mark Kelly Tyler. Uh, who has given us a rich history, uh, a snippet, if you will, of the history of the AME Church and the work of Mother Bethel. You can follow him on all the social media platforms and Mark Kelly Tyler. So please find him, connect with him, learn more about him, learn more about Mother Bethel, be engaged in works of justice. Uh, so again, we wanna thank you for being with us today. As so many congregations are doing, Carter Community is worshiping virtually. So we invite you that if you don't have an option or a choice, uh, come visit us every Sunday at 11 a.m. for our worship service, which airs live on this Facebook platform. You can email us at cartercommunityame at gmail.com. You can visit us on YouTube as well. Just search Carter Community AME Church. Uh, so we thank God for each and every one of you. And I praise God that you, again, that you thought enough of God and of us to be here with us today. So please, beloved, wherever you may be, it is my prayer that God will bless you and keep you until we have the good blessing of being together again. Thank you again for joining us on Conversations with a Pastor.